Any of the rest of y'all grow up like that? Can you see it yet? Is it clear enough? Can't read it. It's a picture of a, supposed to be a butter knife. This is where I come from. This is also known as a flathead screwdriver. Truth be told, it's really a Swiss Army knife because it could also be used to pry a lid off a mason jar. If you can't, you know, you unscrew the top and you got the little sealed lid, you can stick it in there and pop that thing off. Uh, you can use it to pop out staples. If you've got staples you need to remove, uh, it's a letter opener. Uh, in a pinch, it's a paint stir. Um, you can use the heavy end if it's good silverware and use it as a, to nail in tacks on the back of those little little Walmart furniture, you know, that's got the little cardboard thick that you have to tack on there. I've had to do that before. And, and, uh, and if one was so inclined, you could use it to spread butter on bread. I mean, if you're a weirdo or something like that, you know. But uh, there are better tools, no doubt, to do all of those things that I mentioned. But probably everybody in this room has used a butter knife in a way that it wasn't intended to be used. You used it for something else. And even though there was a better tool, maybe for whatever reason at that moment, you didn't have access to that tool. This was the best that you had. And so you were able to still just kind of get the job done, even though that wasn't the best tool for the job. And it got me to thinking if there were other areas of life that are like this, that perhaps there is a better, quote, tool to get the job done, but that doesn't mean that you still can't do what you need to do with what you've got. Uh, you hear it a lot of times when you ask people or try to encourage people to step into roles that maybe they haven't been familiar with or comfortable with or ever done in the past. Um, sometimes we think because somebody else might can do it better, whatever that means, um, we think that means that we can't do it at all or we shouldn't do it at all. If there's somebody better for the job, then they ought to do it uh, and I shouldn't have to do it. And you can see a bunch of the suggestions on the, you know, I wish I was a good song leader. I've heard a lot of people say that. Boy, I wish I was a good song leader. I wish I could get up and teach or preach. Uh, I wish I wasn't scared to be up in front of people. I wish I, wish I had the money to just help people. I've heard that a lot of times. Everybody, everybody says, well, you know, if I ever got rich, I'd do all kind of good. They talk about all the good that they would do. Uh, you don't have to be rich to do good, though. And I hope that as you've been doing this Thanksgiving thing over the last few weeks that you've seen that, sometimes the smallest gesture from you can have the biggest impact on somebody because the reality is this. If you're in a position of need, it doesn't have to be a great big expensive need. Look, if I'm broke down on the side of the road, I don't need you to buy me a new car. I just need you to take me to the gas station. I just need you to pick me up and take me home or something like that. I don't need a new car. So don't think that maybe because, well, if I don't have a lot of money, then I can't help a lot of people. That's not true at all. I wish I knew the Bible like so-and-so did. I wish I could lead prayers like that. I wish I was more of a leader. I wish, I wish, I wish, and we could fill it in with a dozen other things. Truth is, everybody in this room has things that they are naturally gifted and skilled for. Things that come easy to you. You don't have to think about it. It's not considered work for you because it's just, you just do it. It's just easy to you. Somebody else is looking at you though, watching you do that just with ease. And they're thinking, man, I wish I could do that. And that's fine. We've all got our skill sets and things like that. But here's the concern that I have. Oftentimes we think that if we can't do it as well as somebody else, that means that we can't or shouldn't do it at all. And that's simply not the case because you know what? A flathead screwdriver was designed to turn a flathead screw. But if I don't have hand access to one of those, I can still use a butter knife to get the job done. And that's what we're going to be talking about tonight is people that God has used throughout history that if truth be told, if we were looking for someone to pick, we would have never picked these people. There's no way in a thousand years we would have ever picked these people for the task that they had been given. Maybe we'd have picked them for something else, but not for the task that they had been given. And yet that is precisely who God chose. Now I think there's a few reasons why. It's not the purpose of this lesson to explore that, but I do want to throw them out. Sometimes God uses unexpected people, people that no one else would choose, because he wants to demonstrate that the power and the wisdom comes from him, not them. 
Sometimes God picks people that would never. Gideon's one of the greatest examples. Gideon was a, a, a judge that led his people to drive out the enemies. And folks, Gideon was a coward. There's just no other way to say it. He was a coward. He tried every way in the world to get out of it, but God wouldn't let him. because He said, I've chosen you, and you're going to do it. Now, I'm sure there were bigger, badder, tougher. I'm sure there were some Rambo Israelites walking around in the days of Gideon. But you know what? If it was a big army with a great leader and world-class weapons, it would be hard to see God's glory shining in victory. And so sometimes God chooses those that we would overlook because He wants us to see Him not them. He wants the glory to come to him, not in the talent or ability or skill of somebody else. Another reason is this, I think. Sometimes God wants to show that you can be elevated above what you are now. Just because you're not able now doesn't mean you don't have it in you to do it. Just because you've never done it doesn't mean that you might not become great at it. Everybody in this room has their own gifts and talents, but chances are the very first time you did it, you didn't just knock it out of the park. Amazing. But you were able to do it, and for whatever reason, you enjoyed it or felt you could do it, and you kept doing it, and you kept doing it, and then you wound up getting good at it. Very few people in life are born naturally with just amazing skill, and just right out of the package, they're able to do something amazing. Most people have to spend a lot of time when people aren't looking, getting really good at it before anybody starts to notice them. And so just because you might not be good at something on this list, and this is just, this list isn't important, it's just some of the things that I hear people say a lot, just because you're not good at something on this list now doesn't mean that you're not. You just may not have the practice yet. And so that's what today is going to be about, or what tonight's going to be about, looking at some of the people that God has used that might be surprising. God has used people that we would describe as feeble, to accomplish great things. I want to start tonight in Genesis chapter 12, and I'm just going to go ahead and tell you, if you want to follow along, get your Bible out and just kind of jump along with me. We're going to kind of pass through quickly the Abraham story. We're not going to tell a lot of it. I chose the scriptures I chose because they emphasize the point. If you're looking to begin a nation, you don't pick a 75-year-old man and woman who don't have children. That doesn't make any sense. And yet that is precisely who God picks. And here's where God really shows his sense of humor. He tells them that he's going to make them a great nation when they're 75. Do you know when he does it? 25 years later. God's trying to make a point here. I'm the one who is behind all of this. But let's start Abraham's journey with them. Abraham and Sarah, they're old, they're beyond the years of childbearing, and yet God says, I'm going to use you as the foundation for a family that is going to result in the saving of the world. Start with me in Genesis chapter 12 and verse number 4. So Abram went, as the Lord had told him, lot with him, Abraham was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Check, flip over to chapter 15. Pick up with me in verse number 1. We've got a 75-year-old man when the story begins. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless. And the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars if you're able to number them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And Abraham believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. Chapter 17, verse number 1, a little more time goes by. Our 75-year-old man's now 99 years old. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and told him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you, and may multiply you greatly. 
Then Abram fell on his face and said to him, said to God, Behold, my covenant is with, and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. Abram translates uh, uh, exalted father. That's what the name Abram means. But God says, I'm going to change your name. God really likes to up the ante. 75 year old man, his name's exalted father. God says, I'm going to make you a great nation. 25 years later, God says, I'm going to change your name to Abraham, which means father of multitudes or fathers of nations, because you're not just going to be the father of multitudes of people. You're going to be the father of multitudes of nations. Again, none of this makes any sense. Verse number 5, For I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and your offspring after you the land of your sojourning, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Drop down to verse 15. God said to Abraham, As for Sarah, your wife, you shall not call her any more Sarah, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall become nations. Kings of people shall proceed from her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said to himself, Shall a child be born to a man who is a hundred years old? Shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. God said, No, Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son. And you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his offspring after him. Flip over to chapter 18. We're almost done with the story of Abraham. Jump in with me in verse number 9 beginning. This is when the angels visit with Abraham and Sarah before the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And the angel said to him, where is Sarah your wife? And he said, she's in the tent. And the Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year. And Sarah your wife shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent door behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in years. The way of women had ceased to be with Sarah. So Sarah laughed to herself saying, after I'm worn out and my Lord is old, shall I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, shall I indeed bear a child now that I'm old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you about this time next year, and Sarah shall have a son. You'll look with me in chapter 21, we get the end of the story, beginning in verse number 1. The Lord visited Sarah as he said, and the Lord did to Sarah as he had promised. And Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age, at the time of which God had spoken to him. Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, whom Sarah bore to him, Isaac. The name means laughter. After Abraham, and Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, as God had commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. And Sarah said, God has made laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh over me. And she said, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse a child? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. Again, none of this makes any sense from our perspective. If I told you today I need you to go out and find a couple, and we need to get this couple having children so that we can build a great nation out of this couple and their children, I don't think anybody in here is going to the nursing home to start looking, looking for their, looking for their, their prime real estate. But that's exactly what God did. He chose these feeble folks. Because all the glory was given to him. But it's not just that. Sometimes God chooses people who are young and strong, but they've got shady pasts. You look at the story of Moses. He was a fugitive twice in his life. He was a fugitive as a baby. 
Actually, I guess you could say technically he was a fugitive three times now I think about it. He was a fugitive when he was a baby. He was a fugitive after he murdered an Egyptian. And then he was an, a fugitive after the Passover when he takes the Israelite slaves and leaves them out. And then the army of Pharaoh comes after him. So he's got a lot of history of running from the law, if you will. Pick up with me Exodus chapter 2 and verse number 1 beginning. A man from the house of Levi went and took as his wife a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. You remember, chapter 1 says there's a law that says any time a male is born to the Hebrews, that they're to throw the baby into the river. And so she has to hide the baby. Verse 3, he's a fugitive, if you will. Verse 3, when she could hide him no longer, she took him for a basket made of brushels, daubed it with, um, with pitch, and she put the child in it and placed it among the reeds by the river banks. And his sister stood at a distance to know what would be done to him. Now the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river. While her young women walked beside the river, she saw the basket among the reeds and sent her servant woman, and she took it. And when she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby was crying. She took pity on him and said, this is one of the Hebrews' children. I want you to notice something. It's not the case that she did not know this was a Hebrew child. Soak it in for just a minute. Pharaoh, the one who said, if a Hebrew woman has a little boy, throw him in the river. I want him dead. This is his daughter. This is his daughter. This isn't just some Egyptian woman. This isn't another Hebrew woman. This is daughter of the man who has pronounced a death sentence on Jewish boys. And she finds the baby. Let me ask you a question. If you're hearing this story for the first time, what do you assume comes next? She drowns this baby. Or feeds it to an alligator or takes it to her father or something, right? Isn't that what you assume? Something strange happens. This is one of the Hebrew children. Verse number uh, 6 says, uh, verse number 7 says, Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. So the girl went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. Y'all, I'm telling you, this, this story blows me away every time I read it. God takes Pharaoh's decree to kill the Hebrew boys. And God says, here's how this is going to play out. This boy, he's going to live. He's going to be your grandson. But his mama's going to raise him, and you're going to pay her to do it. I love God's irony, God's sense of humor in the way that he does things. He likes to do that sometimes. This is why you want to be on God's side and not finding yourself as an enemy. Technically, by the way, they obeyed the law, didn't they? They said, put the baby in the river, didn't they? <laughs> so that's what his mama did. She put the baby in the river. Verse uh, number 10, when the child grew up, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses because she said, I drew him out of the water. One day when Moses had grown up, he went out to his people and looked on their burdens, and he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his people. He looked this way and that, and seeing no one... He struck down the Egyptian and hid the body in the sand. When he went out the next day, behold, two Hebrews were struggling together. And he said to the man in the wrong, Why do you strike your companion? He answered, Who made you a prince and a judge over us? Do you mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid. And he thought, Surely the thing is known. When Pharaoh heard of it, he sought to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and stayed in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. Jump to chapter 3 in verse number 1. Moses is now a fugitive from justice. Moses was keeping the flocks of his father-in-law Jethro and the priest of Midian. We're 40 years into the future, by the way. 
And he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it wasn't consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight. Why the bush is not burned? When the Lord saw that he had turned aside, he said to him, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. He said, Do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their suffering and I've come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land flowing with milk and honey to the place of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come up to me and I have seen the oppression which the Egyptians oppressed them with. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? He said, But I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that I have sent you when you have brought the people out of Egypt. You will serve God on this mountain. Moses was a fugitive as a baby. He was a fugitive as a grown man. He was a fugitive 40 years later and God came to him and said, I'm going to use you to be the deliverer and lawgiver of my people. And the promise that I made to your ancestor Abram, that old man that didn't have any children that I've now turned into a nation, I'm going to be with you like I was with him. And I'm going to have you bring him out. And one day you're going to stand on this mountain and you're going to worship me. One last example. We've got to flip to the book of Ruth to get this one. We're choosing Ruth because she doesn't fit the mold for a lot of reasons. Ruth is a foreigner. Ruth is a woman. Ruth is a widow. If you lived in her time, which was the time of Judges, that's three strikes against you right there. Foreigner, widow, and a woman. You ain't got anything going for you. You are the most vulnerable of the vulnerable in your population, in your society, you are the bottom rung. You are the ones that are most easily destroyed, enslaved, killed, you name it, starved to death. And yet God has a plan to use this foreigner. She's not an Israelite, she's a Moabite. She's a widow and she's a refugee on the verge of starvation. And God said, I'm going to use you. That promise that I made to Abraham that I started moving along through Moses, I'm going to use you to perpetuate that promise. And we're going to see here in a minute that if you don't have Ruth, you don't have Jesus. Look with me at Ruth 1, beginning in verse number 3. Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These two took Moabite wives. The name of one was Orpah, the name of the other Ruth. They lived there about ten years, and both Malan and Chilean died, so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. Then she arose with her daughter-in-law to return from the country of Moab, for she heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. Don't overlook the fact that the catalyst behind all of this story is starvation. Why are they leaving? Why did they leave Jerusalem? I mean, did they leave Israel to begin with? Why did they leave Bethlehem? And the, the great irony behind all of this story is Bethlehem literally translates house of bread. That's what the name of the village it means, house of bread. But there's no food there. So they leave and they go to Moab. And then they're in Moab. And now her husband and her sons die, the source of their food is gone. There's no food. And they hear that there's food back again in Bethlehem. So what do they do? We're going to go there. I want you to understand something. These are not people who are just moving to take a new job, moving because they feel like they need a change of scenery. These folks are literally traveling on foot following the food. Now we have those today that do that as well. You know what we call them? 
animals. You know, every now and then we get Florida black bears in Tennessee. When they don't have food source, they'll spread farther. We get Florida black panthers up in Tennessee every now and then. The game warden said we didn't until somebody caught a picture of one on a game camera and put it in the newspaper. The game warden couldn't really argue with it. But what do animals do when there's no food? They just they start walking until they find a place where they can eat. What happens if they don't find food? They die. They become food for another animal or just for the fungus and the grass and the dirt. Starvation is what is behind this. Desperation is what is behind this. Verse 7, so she set out from the place where she was with her two daughters-in-law and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. Verse number 11 tells us that uh, Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that, that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go your way. I'm too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, even if I should have a husband this night and should bear sons, would you therefore wait till they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters. It's exceedingly bitter for me. For your sake, the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Then they lifted up their voices and they wept again. Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. And she said, see, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people. Your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there will I be buried. May the Lord do so to me and more also, if anything but death parts me from you. And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more. Drop to the end of the story, chapter 4 and verse 13. I know there's a lot that we're leaving out, but... Ultimately, God provides for both Naomi and Ruth through Boaz, a near kinsman. And when the story comes to an end, this is how it closes. Chapter 4 and verse number 13. Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. And he went in unto her and the Lord gave her conception and she bore a son. Then the, woman, the women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a redeemer. And may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life, a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you is more to you than seven sons. And she's given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap and became his nurse. And the women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. And when we open up Matthew chapter 1, what we're going to find out is that Ruth is in the direct lineage of the Christ child, the son of Abraham that God is going to use to save the world. If you don't have this desperate foreign woman demonstrating this great faith, you don't get the story of Jesus. Now, what's the lesson for me and you tonight? We're going to close in Matthew 25 because I want us to see something, what's going on in here. Not just that God uses unusual and surprising people to do amazing things. I hope that you noticed in all of those stories, one of the things that you saw present in addition to their being unqualified for the job is them being overqualified in terms of faith. They had faith in abundance. Abraham was not young and healthy. Moses didn't have a clean record. And Ruth didn't have anything that she could offer except for great faith. And that was all that God was looking for. Somebody who would walk by faith, put their lives in his hands and let him work out the details. Now, what's he want me and you to see from these stories and from Matthew 25? God used them because he values them. God valued the old man and old woman who were childless. God valued the boy that was raised in foster care, if you will, and wound up being a criminal who was on the run from the law. God valued the woman who was a refugee and had to migrate to other countries just to follow food to stay alive. God saw them and God valued them. And God wants us to see them and value them as well. If you're in Matthew chapter 25 with me, pick up in verse 31. 
When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne before Him, will be gathered all the nations, and He will separate people one from the other as a shepherd separates sheep from goats. And He'll place the sheep on His right, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come ye, blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and welcome you, naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Did you notice that we've got all three categories from our sermon tonight in this text? We've got the feeble. I was sick, and you visited me. The shut-ins the nursing homes, the elderly, the chronically ill, the disabled. God said, you saw them, and you valued them enough to make yourself their servant. We've got the fugitive. I was in prison, and you came to me. The one that society says has already had enough second chances and doesn't deserve any more. The one that society says, you're never going to get them to change. There's no hope for them. The foreigner. I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger. And that's what foreigner means. That's what stranger means in the biblical context. It refers to foreigners. And you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. What we have to understand is that we will never look into the eyes of another human being who isn't loved and valued and wanted by God. No matter what type of body those eyes are sitting in. When we see them, God wants us to see Him. Now, application time. You can take this lesson tonight any way that you need it. You can use it to spread butter on bread, or you can use it as a, screw, as a screwdriver. Take it either way. And here's what I mean by that. If tonight what you needed to hear was that no matter what your past is, no matter what your situation is, no matter what your limitations are, God can still use you, then I hope that tonight will serve to remind you that you should let God use you. Put your trust and faith in Him and do what you can when you're given the opportunity. Let God worry about the rest. Don't think, well, if I could only, don't worry about that. Do what you can do and trust God to do the rest. So if that's what you needed to hear tonight, I hope that's what you heard. And I hope it'll help to motivate you. If what you needed tonight instead was to hear that no matter who it is, God can use you to love those that are unwelcomed to love those that are un overlooked, to love those that are unwanted, then I hope that you'll let God use you to love people that society often says are unlovable, are unusable, and are worthless. I don't know what your need was tonight. To be reminded that God can use you despite your limitations, or to remind you that there are people around us that the world doesn't value, and God wants you to see them as He does and love them as you love Him. You use the sermon however you need it tonight. But I want to close with one thought. This wasn't meant to be a critique as much as it was just hopefully a motivation. The Thanksgiving thing that we're doing has been, I don't know if it benefits anybody else, if nobody else benefits from it but me and that person whose text I read this morning then it was absolutely worth it all. Because I get to get text messages and phone calls and visits every day with people saying, let me tell you about this week. And folks, started out with a couple of good stories, but as the week has gone on, those stories have gotten better and better and better, and I can't wait to share them with you next Sunday morning. But even more than that, I want to share your story next Sunday morning. If you haven't yet taken the opportunity to let God use you in whatever little way, whatever little way it is this week, I hope tonight was the push that you needed 
to take that step and do it. Maybe the push that you need tonight is encouragement to become a Christian. Maybe, maybe you look and say, why in the world would God want somebody like me in His church? What have I got to offer? Look at what I've done. I don't have much potential or future. I hope that you saw these people tonight and saw yourself through the eyes of God. Saw yourself in the life of Abraham, of Moses, and of Ruth and said, if God can use them, then He can use me. Folks, they weren't heroes when God called them. Abraham wasn't a hero when God called him. He was just a dude, an old man that didn't have much potential. Except God said, if you'll follow me, I'll do great things with you. Will you follow him? Will you follow Jesus starting tonight? Follow him into the grave by putting him on in baptism, dying to sin, being raised again to walk a new life. If there's some way we can help you in your walk with God, come while we stand and sing tonight.